Uh, anybody want to have a conversation about what this talk is about? Is this recorded? Yeah. Okay. Who's doing that? Uh, Who? Raise your hand. Who's, who's recording it? Oh, okay. Is this oh, is this counseling? Straight. That's cool. Awesome. Um, all right. Okay. I'm Dave. Hi. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I was here last year and uh, was kind of disappointed that there wasn't a talk like this. So hopefully, uh, so yeah. Right, right. So that's that's right. I, mean, I figured this is the right place to take it. So. George, nice to meet you. I'm Dave. So. So uh, if I could get a show of hands of how many people know how to program in a programming language. Fantastic. All right. That's exactly the kind of people I wanted to have here. Um, who has who? Is there anyone here that doesn't have Ubuntu or isn't hasn't isn't installing hasn't installed Ubuntu, or, or or at least like has a machine that's running Ubuntu at work at home? Like you, everyone interacts with Ubuntu, right? Okay, good. Um, I had someone ask me about this this morning, and I was kind of like, well, if if you're not running Ubuntu anywhere, this is probably not the best talk to start with. Um, so, anybody have an idea as to what they want to get out of this talk? Can I get a show of hands? Uh, yeah. That will be basically that is the talk here. Yeah. Um, in in terms of packaging packages that are completely new, that is not what I was expecting people to want here. Um, but I do co I do have a few links in my slides that will cover exactly what you want from that. Uh, you had another thing. I had another hand. Any other hands? Make it be official. So it's been it's been sitting in Launchpad. Ah, uh, uh, so you want to do a universe inclusion request is what you want to do. Um, I can give you the buzzwords so that you can Google find the right wiki page. It's probably the best way to do it. I've never actually done a universe inclusion request, um, but that probably that can be done. I can I can I can hopefully handhold you a little bit afterwards. Um, this probably is not going to cover that use case as much. Um, it, basically, basic Debian packaging, but um, in doing the process of doing a universe inclusion request is probably outside of the scope of that. Um, anybody else have ideas as to what they want to get out of this? That I will cover. That I, that'll, I will generally cover. Um, yeah, so so good. You're in the right spot. Fantastic. So it sounds like everyone is kind of figuring this out. We're going to be in, you're all pretty much in the right spot. Um, the priority that I'm going to be covering here today is kind of, you know, we all run Ubuntu and we all hit problems. Um, and my goal is really going to be to kind of, when you go and hit those problems and then you go and fix it for yourself, how do you get that pushed back into the archives so that you don't have to maintain a package yourself? So that's really the use case that this co this presentation covers, um, and I'll, I'll go into it. Um, they asked me to leave a few more minutes between after lunch, just because people are filing in from lunch. So that is what it is. Um, I'll give it another two minutes. But yeah, I, 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 this is awesome. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for me while I'm standing here and just kind of wasting time? So what the question is I, um, that I work at Indeed and I do Linux development and what is that like? Um, basically Indeed is now getting to the size where they were small and had mostly application developers and now they are getting larger and they're starting to hit problems at scale um, that happen to companies that are larger. Um, and previously, they would work around it by, oh, well, CentOS is not working. Let's let's try Ubuntu. Let's do this. Let's let's they they do major crazy changes, and now they've realized that doing that kind of stuff is uh, 
not always the best because you exchange one problem for another. Um, so my job is really to fix the hard problems that other people run into. Um, so I'm kind of internal support for Linux in general at Indeed, um, covering anything someone, anything a developer runs into and goes, uh, I'm stuck, right? So that's kind of what I do. Uh, I'll get into it a little more. Yeah, Indeed.com. I work for Indeed.com. All right. Well, we are we are ten we are eight minutes afterwards. Um, I'll, I'll just jump into it. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dave Chillick, and this is the Ubuntu Development Primer: How to Stop Monkey Patching and Start Committing. Um, I'm Dave Chillick. Chillick on IRC, um, and I am what is called an Ubuntu Core Dev. Uh, what that means is that I have archive permissions. That means I can upload things from Launchpad or upload them into Alt Launchpad for inclusion in Ubuntu. Um, so if you have things that you want sponsorship for, take note of me, uh, ping me on IRC, and then tell me that you saw me at scale, and I promise that I might try to help you out. Um, I'm a little slow, because I don't always do as much IRC work as I do as I used to because of slack on, in my day-to-day -day job, but I'll do my best to try to respond to those things. Uh, yeah? Oh, I'll get into that. I'll cover that. Um, so before I, before I start, before I worked for Indeed, uh, actually, I work for Indeed. I'm a Linux platform engineer. Um, you could also call me a Linux software developer. Uh, but basically, I support anything from the kernel to user space to anything else. And unfortunately, my day job usually covers mostly CentOS, but the entirety of our development environment is all run on Ubuntu, so that's why I exist. Uh, prior to that, I worked for Canonical. I worked in the Ubuntu sustaining engineering teams. Um, where I did en engineering support for Ubuntu Advantage, which is the support arm of Canonical, which allows you to do paid support. So. And prior to that, I worked for IBM in the Linux Technology Center, which really kind of got me into doing Linux development. Um, my wiki page is really kind of bare bones, but that's proof that I exist in Ubuntu, right? All right, so the topics we're going to cover today is we're going to talk about a little bit about getting support. Uh, we'll cover a little bit about Launchpad best practices. We'll talk about how to modify sources from uh, the archives. We'll talk about building uh, su and then submitting changes back into Ubuntu. And if we cover all of that, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the kernel processes because the kernel processes are a little bit different than the rest of the packages in Ubuntu because it's the kernel. All right, so why you might care. Um, does anyone here have self-maintained packages on Ubuntu? Basically, uh, you found a bug in a Python script and then you went and manually hacked a fix for it, or you have a MySQL server that you needed to add a patch to. That is, those people are, that is what we're going to cover here today, is really how to fix those things officially, create a Debian package from it, and then push it back into Ubuntu so that the rest of the community actually uh, benefits from that. Um, if, you're just, if you're interested in giving back to the community, that's another great reason to be here, because you kind of need to know this process in order to actually give back your works back to the community. Uh, if you're tired of having maintenance burden um, all of one-off packages or, or say this guy who wanted to do a, a universe inclusion request for his package, that is another great reason. Um, the other thing is I, I always, I'm a big believer in mentorship beats wiki pages. Um, finding someone who can say, hey, you need to search for these terms on the wiki and that'll lead you to this page is going to beat you trying to find those search terms and reading all the wiki pages hands down. Uh, so that is why I'm here. Um, it is a passion of mine for teaching. If pa teaching paid better, I'd probably be doing that. But it doesn't, so I am a nerd, and I try to teach nerds when I can. Um, so the other problem is that wiki pages are always, it can be outdated. Um, so fortunately, when I wrote this talk originally, they were outdated, and I've noticed that they've actually gotten way better. Uh, so that, I probably should cross that line out. All right. So question to the room. Where does everyone go for support? What do you do when you have a problem? What's your first step? Can I get a show of hands or Google? That's my first one too. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other thoughts on how you hit, fix problems with, that you hit in Ubuntu? Stack Overflow. That is major and Stack Overflow has been an amazing boon to our community. So what? Just going straight into the source code. Well, 
that is fantastic, but if you don't know how to get to the source code in Ubuntu, that's probably a little, little difficult. Um, we're going to cover that, and that's actually a big reason that you might want to be here. Yeah. What? S-Trace, yeah, using, using utilities and actually doing, doing the deep dives. I love what I'm hearing because these are, you guys are the exact people that I, need to, that I wanted to have come to this talk. All right. So, yeah, a number of these were covered. Uh, ones that weren't covered were the Ubuntu forums, uh, Ubuntu Advantage, which is paid support through Canonical. I used to do that. I love those guys. I'm going to shout out to them here. Uh, IRC, these are the channels I was talking about earlier. Ubuntu, Pound Ubuntu is probably the best, the best first place to go for support if you don't know if it's a real bug. You think it might just be, you know, PEPCAC. Problem exists between keyboard and chair. Um, if, Ubuntu Devel, and Ubuntu, Ubuntu Devel is going to be for people who've already created a fix and are wanting mentor, like mentorship on how to actually get that fix included if you have problems in that area or you're an actual Ubuntu developer. Um, so avoid, avoid posting in there, otherwise you're going to be told to go move to Ubuntu unless you keep it technical and keep, keep those questions technical. Ubuntu bugs, if you already have a bug uh, opened and are looking for... Um, looking to progress it in a technical manner. You have a solution, you have a workaround, things like that. Uh, go to Ubuntu Bugs, all right? The last one is really gonna be Launchpad. Um, if you've exhausted all hope and you actually have that bug or you are about to create a bug, um, Launchpad is where you're gonna do that. Keep in mind that this is not a forum. This is not a place to post, hey, I did this and this thing broke. You wanna know that this thing broke because it's actually broken before you start opening bugs on Launchpad. Otherwise, you end up wasting a developer's time who might otherwise be worthwhile actually fixing a, a real bug, right? So let's try to keep Launchpad not a forum. Let's use the forums for, for forum requests and forum things. Oftentimes, we'll see people open threads on Ubuntu forums that end up being opened as bugs in Launchpad. They're like, oh, you know what? We've exhausted all hope. The community hasn't really, fi we haven't figured out a solution, so let's just open a bug and we'll, we'll go from there. All right, so Launchpad. So let's assume you found your bug on Launchpad. A lot of people love to post, oh, this hit me too, why have we not fixed this? This hit me too, why have we not fixed this? And people are not clicking this button. This is a very important button for me as a developer to be able to help to triage whether or not people are actually seeing this bug. So please do not put comments in unless they're technical and useful comments. If they're me too comments, don't use that. Whereas um, this bug, if you click on can anyone read that? That's a little bit low resolution, but uh, that line says, this, this bug affects five people. Does this bug affect you? If you click the little pencil next to it, you can click, yes, this affects me too, and then you can subscribe yourself to the bug, and what ends up happening is that increases the heat. As developers go through and actually look to see what bugs most people are hitting and which are gonna have the most impact if they go and work on actu and actually fixing it, um, they're gonna be looking at the heat uh, to try to determine what's the most important bugs. Um, and then, of course, make sure you subscribe to yourself because you don't, I can't tell you how many people will create a bug, they'll fire and forget it, and never, never actually respond to requests for more information. Yeah? Number 34 is a, so it, it's, a, it, it's a number of, like, how many people are, have clicked this bug affects me too? How many people, how many duplicates of this bug have been closed as a duplicate of this bug? Um, and there's a, a number of other heuristics. I'm not exactly sure of the, the exact algorithm, but it's basically, that's kind of what it is. That's a, it gives you a raw, a good rule of thumb. Also, if, if you see a bug that affects you and there's like a two heat on it, you're gonna kind of be like, oh, oh that's why it's not fixed, right? Um, all right. So let's say uh, you have a fix for it and you know the bug and you have a fix. Uh, the next thing you're gonna wanna do is assign yourself. Um, if you go through the effort of trying to fix it and you don't actually, you give up, make sure you remember to unassign it, otherwise uh, the Ubuntu core devs or the Ubuntu developers are not gonna know uh, what, what's the status and they'll probably ping you and be like, hey man, are you working on this, right? All right, and all of these things, adding comments to, to the launch pad, creating bugs, assigning things to yourself, fixing them, all result in a thing called karma. And as you can see, my friend Colin Watson here, who's actually one of the launch pad developers, um, has a karma of 80,670, which is insane. Um, it's, it's the uh, highest one that I know of. Mine is way less than that since I don't do Ubuntu development as my day job anymore. Um, all right, so what do you do if there's no related bug? 
The first thing you need to do is you need to make sure you update your package and make sure your package is, at, is up to the latest version. Because if you, are test, if you are creating a bug on an older version of the package, the first thing a de developer is going to do is be like, hey man, you're back level on this version. Let's make sure you're on the, let, let's, let's get up to the, a proper version first. Um, the next thing is make sure you include all of the logs, uh, including possibly debug output if the command you're running has a verbose option. Uh, and, and if there's any memory dumps, uh, include those as well. Um, and the next thing you might want to do is test the Ubuntu development packages. And by development packages, I mean like today that would be Disco, right? So that's the release that's in development, that'd be the latest thing, right? Uh, the reason we want that is because that would tell us whether or not there's already a fix in an Ubuntu package. Sometimes if it's, a, if it's a small delta between the version you're on and the one that's in development, we'll just do a, a, a backport of that package into uh, the backports archive. All right, I had a few questions. How do you get a memory dump? Um, typically, you're going to have to set ulimit. Uh, you're going to have to configure ulimit to actually save memory dumps. Uh, I think it might actually be included by default. It might be on by default. You might have to check. It might just be because I have it turned on because of all the package that I've installed. Um, but you usually have to have to do that. Um, if it's not dumping for you, you don't need to create a memory dump because that's going to be just way too much effort, um, including more in. in Including a step-by-step -step how to reproduce the problem would be way more important, way more useful. Um, other questions? All right. I know this is probably remedial given how advanced this group seems to be, um, but it's important to go through because, you know, bug etiquette on Launchpad is kind of not obvious. All right. So uh, given that, given that all of these questions, a better way to create a bug on Launchpad is actually run Ubuntu bug against the package you're running. Um, the reason for this is this will actually go through and collect all the logs for you. And then it'll open up a browser with your uh, with the AppWort uh, output. And I'm sorry, that thing is awesome. But <laughs> I just I just just saw it and was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it'll create a uh, sorry, it threw me off. It'll create a number of it'll create all of your logs and it'll create the bug for you. And then it'll also go and check for duplicates based on the information it grabbed. Um, so what this will do is it'll all, it it helps triage the bugs for Ubuntu without having to actually have someone doing the triage. It allows us to have distributed triage, essentially. Um, so that's cool. All right, so let's say you identified that it's a real bug, there's no duplicates, you've opened your bug, or you've assigned yourself to the bug that you've discovered. Um, what's the first thing to do? You've checked, you've checked that the uh, upstream series or development series doesn't have a fix for this. The next thing to do is to really check the upstream project. So let's say you have, you, you have a problem in MySQL, um, it's not fixed in the disco release of MySQL. Next thing would be to grab MySQL, build and install it as MySQL recommends, see if it's now resolved in MySQL's upstream. That would be a, that is a good source of, that is a good point, uh, because then what we can do is we can do a git bisect on MySQL to identify the patch that's resolved your problem, and then we can actually backport that patch back into the versions that we care about. So for example, it'd be, it might be Xenial. Xenial is mostly security updates right now, but if, you're, if it's a bad enough patch, we'd go Xenial, Bionic, Cosmic, and then it'd be going into the, to the development and release as well. If it's not fixed in the upstream project, really stop talking to Ubuntu about this because there's not much we can do. The process with, the process with Ubuntu is to pack it, because it's a distro, what we do is we package upstream sources to make it easy for people to install. If the upstream sources do not have a fix for the problem, first thing to do is to fix it in the upstream project, right? So if you fix it, once it's fixed in the upstream project, we can then get the patch accepted back into the Ubuntu archives because we want the people who understand the sources the best to vet that patch before we then push it into Ubuntu. So that's kind of the process for stable, for the way we keep Ubuntu stable, is by making sure that things that go into the develop, things are forced to go into the uh, projects upstream before it comes back into Ubuntu. All right. Everyone clear on that? Or did I, did I, uh, I got a lot of head nod, good head nods. All right, all right. Uh, so what does it look like once you've got that patch, you've, it's been upstreamed or you've identified it in the upstream. Uh, the next thing to do is to really grab your sources from Ubuntu, create a patch in Ubuntu in the Debian patches directory. You're going to edit your change log, identifying yourself as the patch owner. Uh, you're going to build it, test it, submit the dev diff back to Ubuntu, which is actually a little bit um, more interesting. So I'll cover I'll cover that. 
and then we're going to test it some more. All right. So getting the sources. First thing I like to do when I when I know I'm going to do build when I, when I know I'm going to be doing development for an Ubuntu package is I make sure that I grab a bunch of tools that go around Ubuntu development. Um, you'll see Ubuntu Dev Tools, Dev Scripts, Build Essentials, Fake Web, a Fake Root, Kernel Wedge. A lot of these tools are very, this is kind of like my de facto copy paste install when I've in created a new machine because I know I I'm gonna need them at some point in time. You might need some other uh, compilers or interpreters based on the languages that you're looking at, um, but this is a pretty good uh, coverage of most of them. Um, yeah. Has anyone heard of R. Madison before? All right, you, I'm gonna blow your mind then, because this is amazing. This is my, this is one of my like favorite tools for finding things about Ubuntu. Um, but what it does is it goes and shows the version package of every support, uh, version of that package in every supported uh, version of Ubuntu. Actually, every supported archive of Ubuntu. So it'll even, it'll even split out um, what went into the original archive and the updates archive, and then maybe it will, might even show you what's in proposed if proposed is different than, than the updates. Um, and then I'm gonna just make a directory. In this case, I'm, I might be looking at bash. And then I'll pull LP source on bash bionic. Everyone, now, when everyone's looking at this, they're going, what is pull LP source, and why am I not doing app get source? Well, the problem with app get source is app get source only works if you have the app source lines or the dpackage source lines in your uh, app package lists. What happens if I'm running Bionic on my laptop and I'm trying to fix something in Disco? Now all of a sudden I'm having to add the app sources, I'm having to add the dpackage source lines for Disco in my Bionic release on my, on my laptop, and that's, that's not a good idea. Because now mis mixing series is not a good idea. What pull up source will do for you is grab it directly, grab the sources directly from launch at pad for the series that you request. Yeah. Um, let me get to my demo, and if it doesn't answer your question, then we'll ask it again, okay? All right, so what you're gonna see when you grab these sources is you're gonna see a Debian directory. Um, I'm not, I wasn't able to attend the last section, which was covering a, a number of package, the last session for Ubuntu UbuCon, which was covering a bunch of packaging things. Uh, but basically what you're gonna find here is you're gonna find a change log, and that change log is not the change log that you might think it is. That is the change log of all of the changes of the delta for Debian and Ubuntu on top of the original sources that we forked from, okay? You're gonna see a, a rules, which is essentially a make file that helps build, build the package. You're gonna see a control file, which has all the package definitions. So for example, if you're running MySQL, you're gonna have a MySQL server, you're gonna have a MySQL common, you're gonna have a MySQL libs. Um, there's gonna be a whole bunch of packages. All of those package definitions are gonna be in the control file. You're gonna see a patches directory. Now this is what we really care about as developers trying to fix Ubuntu and push fixes back into Ubuntu. Um, the patches directory is basically a delta for, of what Debian and Ubuntu have added onto what the original, the original package that came out of the upstream sources, right? So it's basically the delta on top of that, that we forked. We forked and this is the delta, right? Uh, there's a patches series file which def determines the order in which those patches get applied and then you're gonna use what patch inside that uh, source tree to determine what patching mechanism is used in order to control these patches. And uh, all of this is described on the Debian org packaging wiki, which is what that man right there is gonna need to know about in order to get things started to be pushed into, uh, in, started to be pushed into Ubuntu. So creating that Debian package, I don't know if you've gotten that done, but that's step one. After that, you're gonna have to create a universe inclusion request. Yeah. Is there a one-to-one? -one? I cannot guarantee that, but I'm pretty certain that is true. Yeah, um, so yeah. Which brings me to my demo. All right, let's see, no one can see this. Tell me when you can see, start reading in the back there. We're good? All right, so we're gonna go R. Madison, uh, bash. Takes a second because we're hitting the archives. All right, so this is pretty, this is a ton of text, the ball of text, but the, the columns that we care about most is the second column and the third column. 
Um, can I, if I highlight stuff, great. So there was a question earlier as to how to know what version of Ubuntu we forked from. Uh, typically what ends up happening is when Debian forks from an upstream package, they create a version, they use the version from the upstream package, usually this is a pa an upstream tag, right? So in this case, bash was, was probably uh, 4.3. Then Ubuntu, then Debian will add a hyphen Debian revision number. And then when Ubuntu forks from Debian, we will typically create an Ubuntu tag, a keyword. And then the
Uh, all right, so basically we can do a quilt pop minus A, which will remove all of the patches and give us exactly what we had when we originally forked from, from the upstream bash version. And I can do a quilt push minus A, which will push everything back on. Um, that's the basics of quilt. Uh, there's also, I'll, I'll get a little bit farther on, but one thing to think about with quilt, uh, which is not always the best, huh? Battery, all right. <sighs> so, Quilt is great. You're gonna have to know a little bit about quilts, but it's not, not my preferred way of doing development. Uh, what I prefer to do is make my changes to the sources. And then what I'll do is I'll do a DCH minus I, which you're gonna have to do in both cases, which is, will actually increment the change log and update the change log. And then you can do a dpackage source minus minus commit, which will do a diff between your current directory, the, your current sources, and the original package, do a diff, and create a dev diff, uh, create a patch for you from that, which is actually way more automated. Um, all right, so I can, what, yeah. Huh? Uh, DCH just stands for Debian change log. It's just, a, it's just another utility. I'm throwing it out there, it's, it's easy. You could manually edit the, D, the, the change log, but I'll show you in the demo exactly why I use DCH and not manually editing the change log. Um, so DCH, D package source minus minus commit, creates the Debian patches, creates the patch in Debian patches for you, and then it'll add it to Debian patches series for you at the end of that file. And then it'll launch a text editor and ask you to fill out a DEP3 header for the patch you just created. Uh, DEP3 is the standard that Debian and Ubuntu use to tag each patch to identify where it came from, who wrote it, and where it's going. It's essentially the, the three major things. Um, there's probably a few more that it, someone's gonna yell at me on the internet for, but uh, whatever. So. so DCH minus I, you're gonna edit the change log and this is gonna add a change log entry. It'll include, you're gonna wanna include the launchpad description, the launchpad bug number, because what this does is once it gets included in the archives, it'll automatically work through the workflow uh, in launchpad by incrementing the bug from in progress to uh, proposed to released, right? Um, uh, and one thing to keep in mind is you're gonna wanna try to follow, follow the format of the change log of the other entries because, uh, because we're based on Debian, each Debian maintainer keeps a slightly different version of how they maintain their change logs. So we wanna kinda just keep it identical and the best way to do that is just to look lower down in the file. Um, and then you're gonna wanna make sure that your patch actually got listed in Debian patches series. I haven't ever seen it not, but it's a sanity check. All right, so we're gonna now edit bash. Uh, can I get my mic stand again? <laughs> I am so sorry, man, what's your name? George. George, nice to meet you, thank you, man. All right, so we've now got bash. Um, has anyone wanted to screw with their coworkers? All right, all right, so this is awesome. Um, I happen to know that if you grep for PS1, anyone know what PS1 is? It is the shell prompt, yes. So if I, I happen to know that if I, this gets evaluated in y.tab.c because I'm a responsible presenter and looked this up earlier, um, I'm gonna look for PS1 and I am going to comment this out. PS1 prompt equals honed dollar space quote. All right. Oh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it wrong first, right? So what ends up happening is I, I made my changes. Now I'm going to. And it, what do I do next? Yeah, love to love to type this out. Hold on. I asked a question, my question was, what do I do next? I've made my changes. Did anyone memorize my slides quickly and figure out what I have to do next after I made my changes? Hmm? Anybody, anybody? 
DCA client side, yes, that is the next thing to do. All right, this is what DCH do, does for you. If you don't use DCH, you're not gonna get this fast version number. So the dash I says to increment the version number. Um, you notice that it immediately went from uh, dash two Ubuntu one to dash two Ubuntu two. It set unreleased because uh, it doesn't know what archive it wants to go into. And um, it also added my, my tag. This is actually included in, it added my dev email, which is a bash, uh, a bash RC uh, alias, uh, sorry, uh, environment variable. And then it also you put a timestamp for when I made this change. So, um, honed Daryl, thank you Daryl, you deserve this. And what I would do now is I'd also make sure that I'm solving a launchpad bug. So if you notice downstairs, down below, we have num launchpad number, we're gonna be solving one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, oh, last thing we need to do is need to worry about which version of Ubuntu this is going into. This is gonna be going into Bionic because it's a Bionic package that I'm fixing. All right. Cool. Yeah. So I did the what? The configure file? Yeah, I probably could. I, I don't know. This is just this uh, demo purposes. This is what I figured out in three seconds. So. Um, all right, so uh, everyone noticed that I had a, a, a bug in my C, right? Because we're all awesome developers. Um, and, I, and, I, and now I've, but sorry, before I realized that, let's say I, I, I did a dpackage source minus minus commit, if I could spell commit. Now it asks me for what my patch, file, patch name is gonna be. Let's make it owned, that patch. And it brings up this great, great little, um, a great little template. This is the depth, depth reach template I was talking about. This is what the Debian developers, Debian and Ubuntu developers are gonna use to identify what in the world this patch is and why it exists in, in the archives. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a good, you're gonna wanna have a good description here, not just pwn. Um, and you're also gonna wanna also include things like the launch ad bug number. So you see bug Ubuntu. You see, I, if I highlight this, is that good? You notice that I, it identified the bug that I used simply from the LP colon number that I used in the, in the Debian changelog. Uh, but you're also, because you're pulling this from upstream because we're all responsible developers and we push our fix up, fixes upstream first, you're gonna wanna put origin, you're gonna wanna fill out this origin tag and give the URL of the upstream origin patch. Um, this way, when you submit your dev diff to a, to a core dev, they can actually go and verify that what you are committing is the same thing that was coming from the upstream, possibly massaged in order to fix, to work with the sources you're looking at, but it gives them a good place to start with. You gave them as much information as, as you can to approve your, your information, uh, approve your submission. Uh, and fill out any of the others that might be appropriate. There's actually a depth three uh, information on the Debian packaging wiki page that I linked at, earlier in the slides. All right, so I don't even know if this is gonna work. Well, it's okay, great. All right, so we covered that. So now, back to my problem in my C code, right? So now I've created the patch. Do I wanna undo everything and then redo the patch? No. Um, let's go back to my lightest tab.c, go to back to TS1. And I notice I missed this, this semicolon. So I added the semicolon to ytab.c, but I've already got the patch in the series file. This is why you wanna know quilt. What I can do now is I can just do a quilt refresh and then it'll just refresh my patch with the new version of changes that I have, okay? So that's kind of how, that's kind of how um, my debug, fixing, de fixing bug workflow goes, goes through is I kind of use dpackage source commit when I think it's ready and then I'll use quilt refresh after that. All right, any questions? Did I go too fast or too loudly? No, all right. So the next thing you need to do is you need to um, build the package with dbuild minus d and minus capital S. A minus d is gonna say ignore, uh, ignore build depends. And the reason you wanna do this is because you do not want to build packages on your machine directly. You always wanna have it in, in a container of some sort because otherwise you're just gonna muddy your machine with a 
ton of packages and to not be able to get rid of them. Um, the second thing it does is it signs the package. Uh, you notice that I had my, I used, it used my deb email a signature to, for the Debian change log. It's gonna use that deb email uh, environment variable as well to identify which GPG key it uses to sign my DSC file. Okay, so that's what it's doing with the dash s. So let's, let me. The next thing we'll do is then once you create your source package, you end up building it using sbuild. Sbuild is the best way to build packages for Ubuntu. It's basically, a sh it's a kind of a true build. Um, and there's a whole, there's a great wiki page, so I'm not gonna go through each command on how to deploy sbuild. Um, follow this, every Debian developer, every Ubuntu developer follows this every time they create a new laptop or buy a new laptop. Okay, and then once you've built your package and you, you're sure it builds and you're sure it works, and what you want to do is you're going to grab a deb diff of the original package and the package, your new package. And what that is, is that's a, just a, the, it's just the difference between that you created, right? And that is what you're going to upload to Launchpad for a Debian developer to sponsor. I keep saying Debian, but Debian Ubuntu developer. Um, all right, so our, we go to our, our demo. Build minus D minus S. Uh, it looks weird. What? Oh. Shoot. Yeah. It was right. Maybe it's just big. All right, so we're building our source package. Uh, this is the source package that will end up eventually getting built and being pushed into the Launchpad builders for creating of the package. Um, you'll notice at the bottom here, you'll see that sign file for the changes is signed by Dave, Dave Chillick, Chillick at Ubuntu.com. All right, next thing is to S build minus A minus D. Actually, let's see what that created. All right, so we now had, we previously had just uh, Ubuntu 1 sources. Now we have an Ubuntu 2 sources, right? Um, and what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna build against this DSC file. Now what sbuild is gonna do, it's gonna spawn a new chroot in var run sroot mount bionic, and then it'll update itself to the latest version of all dependencies, including all of those in propose, and then it'll run the build. And we're not gonna sit here and watch this because this I think takes like 20 minutes, um, but you'll see, see everyone saw apt go by, or it's going by right now, apt get is going by right now. All right, so the next thing we need to do is we need to test the package. All right, so how would I test this? Easiest way is to install it on Daryl's machine and mess with it, right? Um, as, unfortunately, since Daryl's not here, uh, I am going to just install it on my local machine to show that, show that it actually worked, right? I've already got it built because I've done this before. Um, and I'm just going to do package minus I. Oh, you can't see that. On bash. And it's now installed. Yeah. It is now installed. So if I spawn a new terminal, I've now been pwned, uh, which is, right? Fantastic, hey, we patched, we patched resources in Ubuntu and now we are, uh, we've done the hard part. Now the harder part is actually getting it, getting it accepted and getting it pushed into the archives. Um, so well, how that works. 
uh, let's actually, yeah. So we've tested our package. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a dev diff and attach that to Launchpad. So what does that look like? Um, dev diff. Can everyone read some of this or is it just way down at the bottom? All right, so everyone's seen a diff before, right? That's all this is. It shows us the change log change. Um, the only interesting thing is that you'll see that the patch that we created is actually added as its own new file, right? So pwned.patch in here is actually created as its own new file. Um, you see all the pluses at the edge here. Great, and that's what you're gonna upload to Launchpad. Uh, what you're gonna need to do though, is now you've just solved it, we've just solved it for, for Bionic. You're gonna need to install, you're gonna need to fix it for Cosmic and Disco, because we can't have Bionic fix and then have someone upgrade to Cosmic or Disco and go, hey look, it was working in Bionic and now it's broken again. Um, so you're gonna have to create three different dev diffs. Typically this is pretty easy because the dev diffs for the three different versions is, might be really close and the, the same patch might apply in all three. But if it doesn't, you're gonna have to port those patches around and make sure they cleanly apply. All right, now the next thing to do is once you've uploaded your dev diff into, onto Launchpad, you're gonna have to fill out wh what is called an SRU template. SRU s stands for Stable Release Update. And this is the wiki page you're gonna wanna look at in order to grab the template for the stable release updates. And you're gonna copy and paste that template into the top of your Launchpad bug, okay? Everyone follow that? I think I've been talking for a while, so. Um, now what this, is, what this is useful for is this is useful for the core dev that's going to try and sponsor your patch. They're gonna look at this SRU template and it basically asks you things like, how do you recreate the original bug? What, t what I will do as a core dev when I'm sponsoring a patch is I'm gonna go and actually try to reproduce that on, a, preferably in an LXC container. Um, I'll try to reproduce your exact problem given the steps that you have. If I can't, I'm gonna be like, whoa, something's weird. Um, step two is it'll also tell you how you, uh, it'll ask how you've tested it. Have you pushed it upstream? What are the regression potentials? Um, we don't like breaking people in Ubuntu. We prefer for them not to ever have it work and then have it break after an update. Unfortunately, that happens, but the reason that happens is because we aren't creative enough when we are going and reviewing these things and thinking about what kind of regressions are potential. Um, so you're gonna wanna do your best to kind of identify what regressions might be in play. Um, I, recently, I recently uploaded a fix for a, head, a USB headset and I said, the regression potential is kind of minimal because it currently does not work at all, right? And the fix adds only affects the USB ID for the headset that I'm applying it to. So kind of hard to have a regression there. Um, all right. Okay, next. The next thing you're gonna need to do is you, now you've done all of your bug, you've done all of the uh, administrivia to try and get things done, you're gonna now have to wait on a core dev to actually do their side. Um, the way to do this is to subscribe Ubuntu sponsors to the bug, and then if that you don't get anyone to respond in a timely manner, you're gonna wanna go to Ubuntu Devel and probably ask for a core dev. Be like, hey, does, is, can anyone sponsor this patch? I'd really like to get it uploaded. Um, if you ping me, I'm Chillic on IRC, I will do my best to help out the community as I am a community Ubuntu member uh, Ubuntu, uh, I'm a community Ubuntu core dev, right? So um, a lot of the core devs work for Canonical. I would like to try and help the community um, get their fixes in too. Um, now once you've got it uploaded, once it's uploaded, it doesn't actually get immediately built. Because we wanna keep Ubuntu stable, we wanna make it very difficult for changes to go in that'll affect everyone on the planet, right? So we have at least two people who have archive permissions review it before. And the second person that needs to review it is the SRU, is, is an SRU team member. Um, in order to get their sponsorship, you're gonna wanna subscribe at Ubuntu SRU to the bug. All right. And the reason you need to is process and safety. Um, 
we don't want to break. We want to break as few many, few people as possible, and the best way to like, we don't have a better way. Um, so, all right. Now, once the Ubuntu uh, SRU team member approves your SRU, it will get built by Launchpad and it'll be pushed into the proposed archive. This is what when you go and look at your Ubuntu package manager and you ask, hey, click. I want to run. I want to run proposed because I want to help out the community. It's exactly what you're doing here. Is you are running the packages that were most recently changed, right? Once it hits, uh, once it hits the proposed archive, your job now is to install it from the proposed archive because who knows, your package might get built slightly different on Launchpad or than it than it does on your local machine. These, if you're using sbuild, this is incredibly rare. If you're building it using dbuild or some other package man some other package build mechanism, it's more likely. I've actually seen instances where I used a previous tool called pbuilder, um, where it built with pbuilder just fine, worked with pbuilder just fine, but when I built it with sbuild, it failed to build or it had a completely different functionality because the, the dependencies were pulled in slightly differently. Um, all right, so again, it hits proposed, you gotta test it again. Once you've tested it and proposed, there's gonna be a tag on Launchpad that says verification needed. Now you need to move that tag from verification needed to verification done for every series that your patch is applied for, okay? So if it was applied to Bionic, Cosmic, and Disco, you're gonna need verification done, Bionic, verification done, Cosmic, verification done, Disco. Because if you don't do that, uh, Launchpad will automatically remove your package from the archives. After, I think it's like, it's like a three or six week timeout, all right, and now because we are awesome members of the Debian community, the next thing we do is we're gonna submit it back to Debian. And there's another tool for this called Submit to Debian, which is part of the Ubuntu dev scripts. And it will actually take your dev disk and create a bug on De Debian's bug, bug tracker and upload that dev disk there. Um, the other reason for submitting it back to Debian is we do not want to have a delta with Debian. Um, we, what we do as Ubuntu is we stabilize the sta unstable or testing packages that we get from Debian and have a decent cadence so that it's predictable and useful for normal people. Um, Debian is great, we love Debian, um, and we want them to succeed as much as Ubuntu succeeds. And by submitting our patches back to Debian, we help them out as much as they help us. Or we try to help them out, they, help, they do an awful lot of work. All right, so who cares about the kernel? I am, I am, oh, I got two minutes. Do we get, have anyone that cares about the kernel? All right, I, so when I was working for Canonical, I was actually part of the uh, sustaining engineering team and I was actually attached to also doing some kernel work with the kernel team. So I, I spent a lot of time talking with these guys and I know them all pretty well. Um, so l let's, let's just jump into it. How do people get sources for their kernel? For Ubuntu, anyone, anyone not reading my slide and want to tell me? <laughs> no, 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 no. But that's that's a good try, good try. No, so um, that's exactly what a lot of people tell me is when they're like, oh, I just go to kernel.org for the sources. Well, the problem is Ubuntu has a delta on top of the kernel as much as they have a de delta on top of, of Debian. And the reason for this is that we want to make Ubuntu function for as many people as possible. And there's lots of reasons why um, we, we might have a delta from kernel.org. One reason might be hardware enablement, right? So for example, my, my, well, well, my USB headset isn't a bad example, um, but let's say there's a new version of the processor that we need to make sure works on our, our long-term su long support release, right? So they might have patches for those processors that didn't go into Linux stable, but actually did get pulled into the Bionic series. The other things that you might have is you might have, uh, I'm drawing a blank right now, but the, um, what, is our, what is our security mechanism in Ubuntu? Anyone know? The what? It's not SE Linux, what's the other thing? App Armor, good call, good, good. So uh, the other reason we want to not pull from uh, the kernel.org is kernel.org isn't going to have patches for AppArmor, whereas the ones you pull from Ubuntu are, okay? Um, 
The other nice thing to notice is that we're giving you a Git tree. Who in CentOS land is getting a Git tree for their, their kernel sources? Absolutely zero. If you're running RHEL or CentOS, you're getting an RPM source package and a tarball. We give you a Git tree with every single one of the patches broken out in that Git tree. It's not just a fork plus patches as we have for all the rest of the packages. It is a full history of that Git tree. Um, it's really great. The other nice thing is you can do when you clone this, you can actually reference the upstream Linux uh, tree. So in, uh, you see git clone, I referenced Linux here on this slide right here. Oh. Um, that will actually decrease the amount of space that it takes up on your machine. Once you've pulled those sources, there's now two branches that you need to care about. There's master, which is gonna be what is sitting in updates, and there's going to be master next, which is what is sitting in propose. Um, so depending on what you're looking at, that'll be the difference between those two branches. The other thing you're gonna need to know is that the, um, uh, sorry, the, um, the other thing you might wanna know is that there are also gonna be HWE branches for uh, the LTS releases. All right. So let's say you have a problem with the Ubuntu kernels. First thing, you're gonna go through a very similar process as you would with any package. You're gonna wanna make sure it's first fixed in, a, in the upstream Linux kernel, like 5.1 bleeding edge RC, you know, non-existent right now, right? Um, easiest way to do that is actually to use the Ubuntu kernel mainline build. If anyone's running these kernel mainline builds on their Ubuntu machines, you probably should not. Um, these do not include all of the patches. These are very bleeding edge. These are very much development. I would not recommend this ever. Um, but in order to test to see if your, fi your stuff is fixed in an, up in an updated kernel, this is the fastest way to get a kernel that is at the latest in order to determine if you have a, your kernel's actually been fixed. Once you've discovered that it's fixed in these upstream kernels, then you can go ahead and bisect it and bring that bisection back, the, the patch from, that you discover from that dissection back into the actual Ubuntu kernel. All right, so you're gonna bisect it, find that rec correct commit, and then you're gonna do a git cherry pick minus sex, which is sign, edit, and give me a cherry pick uh, commit I hash on the upstream commit, and that'll just apply it to the Ubuntu tree. That'll allow you to use git send email to push that, uh, that patch back up to uh, the, the Ubuntu kernel mailing list. All right, if it's not already been fixed in the mainline kernel, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is fix it in the upstream, in the mainline kernel, and then possibly just submit it back into Linux stable. Because you're a good community member, submitting it to Linux stable will actually allow it to be included by default by the Ubuntu, uh, by the Ubuntu kernel team. Uh, the Ubuntu kernel team does their best to follow Linux stable rules, um, but again, we have the directive of making, Ubuntu, making Linux easy for everybody. So there are times when we will accept a feature patch in order to fix something that we know is affecting a lot of users. Um, and I say we loosely because I'm actually not on the team any, anymore or in the company, so don't yell at me. Uh, but in order, to, in order to submit those patches back, you're gonna follow the documentation, uh, stable kernel rules. Actually, I think it's like documentation process um, stable kernel rules now. They, they've, the documentation has actually changed since this. I thought I updated that, but Oh well. Um, so once it gets pushed into Linux stable, the Ubuntu teams will eventually uh, include it. However, a much easier way to, to resolve problems with hardware dependencies is to actually run the HWE kernels. Now the HWE stands for hardware enablement kernels. And if you are buying new servers today and are trying to install Xenial, your best bet is to run the H Linux HWE kernels in order to get those to run as best they can. If you're running Bionic and trying to install servers from AMD, again, HWE kernels, right? Um, but those are basically the new series of kernels brought back onto the LTS release. So for example, um, in, in Bionic, that would be the Cosmic kernel, okay? All right, so you've submitted to Upstream. You've, oh, there's the correct link. Doc, this is actually the, the, the uh, where it lives in the kernel sources. So if you download the kernel, 
you'll see documentation process submitting patches. We'll describe how to submit patches back into the kernel community. I have a whole other talk about submitting patches to back to the Linux kernel. Um, submitting it to stable, we've already covered. And now building your kernel. So typically when you go to build a kernel, you're gonna do a make old config and then make. And then just for quick iteration, if you're actually creating your own patches. Um, this is not recommended for doing any kind of distribution to servers um, because you've just got a VM Linux and a folder of modules. It's not really easily installable. It's not really easily anything. Um, if you're building off of the Ubuntu kernel trees though, and you alias FDR to fake, fake root Debian rules, quick note there. Um, if I do FDR prepare generic, that'll create the config for that kernel that I'm trying to build. And then it'll, if I do FDR binary gen generic, that will actually create Debian packages that you can then distribute elsewhere. Um, all right, um, and just a quick note, if you need to, if you're doing development and you just need to build a subset of your tree and you're using the Ubuntu, uh, the Ubuntu tree, uh, this is how you would point it to the build directory so that you can build just a small subset of the tree. Other patches, so we have these things, this idea of sauce patches in Ubuntu, and those are the patches that I was talking about that are not Linux stable appropriate, but still are, uh, they, they may not even be mainline appropriate, but they are something that we consider valuable and useful to the users of Ubuntu. Um, there aren't very many of them, but they do exist, um, and they make our lives and the users' lives better, and that's why we keep them. Um, sometimes they're not in, up, accepted upstream for political reasons, and I'm not gonna discuss that any further, so. Um, all right, so the, once you've got your patch, uh, this page is actually great for describing where to grab, uh, how to deal with the kernel community, the Ubuntu kernel community, um, and they're usually really responsive on that mailing list because it doesn't have a ton of, of mail, so that's how you push your fix back into Ubuntu is actually, sorry, how you push your kernel fix back into Ubuntu is actually pushing it onto the mailing list, which is very similar to what the upstream Linux kernel process is. All right. Any questions? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, no, I don't have the handle. Uh, here, let's get the handle to you before we... Is that, is that it right there? There it is. Tech check. I have a feeling okay. like a few of you actually got something out of that talk and it makes me really happy. I hope, I hope, I hope to be sponsoring now this we're in the very near future. Is that? Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, Ubuntu supports a variety of uh, non x86 uh, hardware. Where, do, where does that get tested? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> where does that come in? So that what, you're gonna have to be more, more specific on that question. So say I, um, uh, have a patch and it builds fine on x86, but uh, you know when it's compiling, it breaks for uh, PowerPC or ARM or something like that. So I'm I'm just trying to understand what the workflow is for uh, Ubuntu for non-x86 hardware. So are you fixing a build a build problem for the alternate architect arch, or are you? I'm just trying to I'm trying to under yeah. I'd, let's say I'm I'm working on x86. Let's fix the build for me, but it breaks for PowerPC. How does how do does, does Ubuntu do builds on all these other architectures yeah, so every before, night? Before, when it gets pushed into propose, the uh, launchpad will automatically build it for all the al alternative architectures as well. Okay, and are all those self-hosted or cross-compiled or? You're not some sure? Some are self-hosted, some are cross-compiled. Ah, so, okay. Yeah, as Good. far as I know. I know the- So, um, it's, so it's the bottom line is it's not really the d developer or the patch uh, writer's responsibility to test other architectures. Um, so, if it gets pushed, if you if you end up breaking another architecture, you're doing something really awesome. Um, but it will get built by Launchpad, and you'll see a build fair failure. It's okay. usually what'll end up happening. Um, cool. I actually haven't broke another build, broke a build yeah. for an alternative arch, so I don't know. Um, we do have a uh, page called FTBFS. So if you go to the wiki.ubuntu.com and look for FTBFS, it's called Failed to Build from Source. And that'll show you all of the packages that fail to build from source for alternate arch, for, for any architecture. Right. Um, typically that's used while we're doing plus one maintenance, which is the 
process we used for bringing Debian back into Ubuntu, um, and that is typically the place when we find fail to build from source problems. Right. Um, but if you want to work on alternative architectures, that's where you cool. probably start. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? And thanks for coming. I have, I was, this is awesome. It <laughs> Uh, it was an excellent talk. Uh, if I followed along correctly, there's a version of Propose for every version of Ubuntu? Uh, yes. And, and where do I get Proposed from? Uh, you add the Proposed archive to your app sources list. Oh. Okay. And the easiest way for an end user to do that is to go into the Ubuntu Software Center and click the Proposed button on, under like Ubuntu Software. Here, I can actually show you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Updates? Really? Oh, fantastic, man. I'm giving another one on kernel, on, uh, kernel basics, or kernel debugging basics, uh, Saturday at 1.30. So uh, the, this is what uh, one, of these, one of these tabs has a, has a proposed, test of proposed archive link. Restricted main universe, proprietary. Yeah, there you go, Bionic Proposed. Okay? That's the easiest way to turn on Proposed. Um, you could actually just modify the app sources list directly. So, this is Mike. Uh, I don't what are the tools you used? Uh, One of the tools you used actually built the software in its own container. Um, and so you don't have to worry about it impacting any of the anything else uh, on your system. Okay. Yeah, that's sure. um, that simple S build wiki page is invaluable in terms of doing that and doing that without screwing up your machine. Yeah, um, that is the best way by far. Anyone else? All right. Bye bye. I'm gonna. Thank you, off. Dave.